hello and welcome everyone. No, it's not. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Welcome to the Bias Speaker Series. My name is Patty Bossert, and I've been asked to introduce our special guest for this evening. Pretty soon, it's this time of year when we have friends and family visiting, and what's the thing on the top of their list of things of, to do? See the Kerala Wild Horses. Well, we're very fortunate tonight that our guest speaker is the herd manager of the Kerala Wild Horses. Meg Puckett accepted the role of herd manager for the Corral Wild Horse Fund in July of 2016. She came to the Corral Wild Horse from, from the Virginia Zoo in Norfolk, where she worked in education, volunteer management, and media and public relations. Before that, she was an educator at the Museum of the Albemarle in Elizabeth City. And she also worked on the USS Monitor Project at the Mariners Museum in Newport News. Meg graduated from Virginia Wesleyan College with degrees in history and English. Meg's background in nonprofits, public history, education and interpretation, and animal science has helped prepare her for the multifaceted role of herd manager. In addition to that, Meg has 30 years experience working with and caring for horses and a deep-rooted love and connection to the Albemarle region. Preserving the ecology and the history of the Outer Banks is something that she's always been passionate about. And the wild horses of Kerala have held a special place in her heart since she was a little girl. Please help me welcome Meg Puckett. Appreciate that. So, yeah, thank you all so much for having me tonight and for coming to listen to me talk about the horses. Um, like Patty said in, in the intro, the horses have always been very, very special to me ever since I was a, a little kid. Um, when I was about 11 years old, I got a photograph of the horses for Christmas one year, and it was, um, it's not really a very great photograph, honestly, but it's, it's the horses walking down the beach, probably taken in 1991, 92, and it's hung in every one of my bedrooms since then. Um, and in 2017, um, I was working for the fund, and we got a phone call that we needed to relocate some horses that were living on an island out in the Sound that had been moved over there in 1999 um, due to some nuisance behaviors like going into Food Lion and raiding the produce section and kicking people who tried to get them out of Food Lion. Um, and so once I got to know those horses in the process of trying to figure out how we were going to get them off the island into our rescue farm, I realized that they were the same horses in that picture that I've had hanging in my bedroom for the last, you know, however many years. So it was a very full circle moment for me um, to, to think, wow, you know, here I am with, with these same horses that, that have been a part of my life since, since I was a little kid. So um, it's, it's very special and important to me, and, and I appreciate being able to be here tonight to share it with you. So. So let's get started. Um, this presentation is kind of an overview of the horses themselves and their history and their genetic makeup and what they are, and then also about what the fund does to manage them, how we manage, why we manage the way we do. So first and foremost, what are they and where do they come from, right? Um, that's probably one of the top questions we get about the horses is, where did they come from? Did they swim off shipwrecks? Were they Ernie Bowden's quarter horses that got loose? Were they Coast Guard horses that, that got turned out there in the 1930s? And the answer to all of those questions is no, but kind of, right? Um, so the, the legend of where these horses came from is just as important as the actual history and the science of what they are. Um, and that's true for, I think, pretty much anything on the Outer Banks, right? Um, you hear the story of Black Blackbeard, right? We all know that Blackbeard did not swim around his ship six times after his head was chopped off, but it's an important part of the story, right? The legend is important. 
And so the same goes for the horses. Um, we do know that there were ships that had horses on them that were, that were brought over here by the Spanish that wrecked off of our coast. And those horses were probably tossed overboard or, you know, swam on their own over to our islands. But that's not how they populated the entire Outer Banks. You know, there were probably some here that ended up that way, but that's not how they got here and they were established here. What we found through historical records and through the DNA um, is that these horses were purposefully bred and brought here by the Spanish. The first horses were sailed over directly from Spain. They load them, loaded them up in the bottom of ships and sailed them over. Um, I cannot imagine how difficult that must have been for the people and for the horses to have to do that. And so once the Spanish um, set up uh, outpost over here um, in, in Central and South America and North America, they set up breeding farms, primarily down in Central and South America. And so they brought breeding stock over to these farms, and then they started breeding these horses down there. And what that meant was, number one, they did not have to put them in a ship and sail them over. Um, I imagine there was probably great loss that way. Um, and it also meant that they had horses that were being born here that were already acclimated to our climate, to the bugs, you know, to the diseases and things like that that they, they just don't have in Europe. Um, and so, you know, that, that meant that they, then they could sail over from Spain down into Central and South America, pick these horses up, and then come up the coast with them to wherever they were going. And so that's how the horses were originally kind of populated all up and down the East Coast. And then after that, there really was a thriving horse trade all up and down the East Coast well into the 18th century and the first part of the 19th century. Um, and so these horses were the foundation for every other breed of horse that was developed in America after that. So how do we establish their importance, right? I mean, it's, it's cool that they came over here from Spain, that they've been here a long time, but what really makes them important? And so a big part of what we are doing as the fund is figuring that out. And, and we can um, use DNA in science to, to learn a lot more about these horses and their ancestry, you know, to where we don't have to rely on the legends and the lore. Um, we, can, we can look at their DNA and tell exactly how they're related to each other and where they came from. Um, we can track breeds. So when, when we take DNA from one of these horses, the, re the geneticist can tell us which modern breeds they're most closely related to. And what we see in that DNA are modern breeds that exist now in Central and South America. And so that lends credence to that theory that that's kind of where they came from. So our horses came first, um, but their DNA is, is not modern. It's not on file anywhere. And so what they match up most closely to are those modern um, ancestors of theirs. So the presence of these genetic markers that indicate that these horses are of Spanish descent, um, we have about 88% Spanish descent in, in the horses that we have DNA tested so far, which is about 150 horses, um, does prove once and for all that they do descend from those horses that were originally brought over here from Spain. Was there, were there domestic horses introduced to the herd over the years? Absolutely. You know, of course there were. There were farmers all up and down the, the Outer Banks that had you know, non-banker horses, right? But, but what we're finding in the DNA of the current herd is that there was not enough um, genetic drift that caused the dilution of the genetics, the, those old, old genes and bloodlines. Um, and they are their own breed. They are banker horses. And that's a really important thing that this DNA research has allowed us to establish, is that they are not a strain, they are not a type, they are their own breed. And they are recognized as their own breed. And they're recognized as what's called a land, land race breed. Um, and that means it's, it's a, a species of usually once domestic animals, and you see it in pigs and sheep and cows too, um, that lives in a very specific region and has developed adaptations based on that region that you do not see in the, in the species anywhere else. So our banker horses here have adaptations. They have, um, you know, their biology is, is different from, from other horses. And so that sets them apart and makes them very culturally significant as well. That's, that's a big part of what it means to be a land race breed is that they are very culturally significant. And so that's why, um, you know, sometimes the science and the culture don't completely mesh, right? Um, if you're familiar with, with, with 
the horses are with us at all, you probably know Raymond the Mule, right? Raymond the Mule is not a purebred banker pony. He's a mule. His dad was a domestic donkey. So genetically, he is not really a banker pony, but culturally and historically, he is, right? His mother was a banker pony. He lived out there his whole life. He is just as culturally significant as the purebred banker ponies. So, you know, it's a little bit of give and take. <laughs> So what about other, other herds on the East Coast? You know, we get asked all the time, well, or what's the difference between them and the Chincopeak ponies? Um, so we have several different herds of feral horses that live up and down the East Coast. Um, we have the, the banker horses here at Kerala, and then there's another herd of banker ponies down um, at Shackleford at Cape Lookout. Those horses are managed by the National Park Service down there. They are in protected land on Shackleford Island. Um, they are genetically the same as the Kerala horses. They're the same breed. There is also a privately owned herd of these horses on Cedar Island, which is near Shackleford. They were Shackleford horses that were moved um, and are privately owned now, but they are genetically the same. Um, that is where Gus, if, if you're familiar with Gus, the stallion that we introduced to the Kerala herd, um, say 2015, I believe, um, he came from Cedar Island. So he is a Shackleford horse, but he was on Cedar Island. And then we have the ponies at Ocracoke, who at one point were the same as, as the horses in Kerala, genetically the same. There were a lot of domestic breeds introduced to that herd over the years, and so now genetically they are not pure bankers like the horses here in Kerala. Um, but again, just like with the mule, they are culturally significant. So, you know, they, they still are banker ponies, even though they do not have those, those genetics that we see here in the herd in Kerala. And then you have Assateague and Chincoteague. Um, those ponies descended from the same original stock. You know, all of these horses came from the same place originally. Um, but again, same, same with Ocracoke. There were lots of domestic stock that was introduced to the Chincoteague and Assateague herds over the years. Um, and they are now their own breed as well. You know, they, they have bred for a very specific type of pony, right? They, they, they want Misty of Chincoteague. And so they have introduced domestic stock to that herd over the years to produce a very particular type of pony. Um, uh, there's also Cumberland Island. Um, Cumberland Island is off the, the coast of Georgia. There is theory that those horses um, are of Spanish descent. No one has ever done DNA testing on them. They are on National Park Service land, and they are not really managed at all. They just kind of exist there, um, and, and they're allowed to stay there, but they're not managed like a lot of the other herds on the East Coast. So I think it would be great one day if somebody did that. I would love to do that, but I have enough to do here, so <laughs> I'll leave that to somebody else. So what makes a banker a banker? Um, you know, I always tell people for as much experience as I have with domestic horses, these ponies are not like any other horse you have ever been around in your life. Um, they think different, they're built different, they, they behave differently, physically they're very, very different. They react differently to different drugs than, than what you see with domestic horses. So they are very, very different. Um, average height is between 12 and 14 hands. A hand is four inches. So that puts an average banker pony is gonna be about four and a half feet at the top point of their shoulders. So they're not big, um, but they are pretty substantial. They're pretty hefty. Um, they weigh between 700 and 1,000 pounds. 1,000 pounds is pretty chunky for, for a banker pony, but we, we definitely have some that are, that are right up there. Um, they have a very deep, narrow chest. They have a very low set tail. And so that gives them a lot of power to get through the sand, to get over the dunes, and to be able to swim. Um, their hooves are snowshoe shaped or pancake shaped. And so just like with a snowshoe, that helps them get through the sand. They have very wide, wide hooves. Um, some of them we found have one less lumbar vertebrae than most domestic horses, which is a very primitive trait. Um, I can't tell you how many that, you know, horses have that trait. You'd have to, you know, be able to examine the skeleton on all of them, but we have found cases of that multiple times in the herd here. Um, and then just as far as, as the way they behave, they are incredibly smart and resourceful. Um, they, they think critically, which is kind of a strange thing to say about an animal, um, but they do. You know, a lot of times you can just see the wheels turning in their head. And that's how they've survived here. 
Um, you know, horses that are flighty, that panic, that can't think for themselves are not going to survive on a barrier island that is sand and scrub oaks, you know, and salt water. Um, it is not a hospitable place for a horse to live. It's not somewhere you would expect to find a horse. But these horses have managed to not just survive here, but they've thrived for 600 years. Um, and that's because they're really good at problem solving and they're really, really good at staying alive. That's, that's probably their top skill, <laughs> is, is staying alive. They're really good at it. Um, their lifespan in the wild, we are finding through DNA research that we have horses in the wild that are probably 30 years old, if not older. Um, you know, prior to, to really getting into the DNA, um, we would say 20s, maybe mid-20s. Um, but but we're, we're making connections with some of these horses where we can age them a lot older than what we originally thought. We've also, you age horses also based on their teeth and the way their teeth wear and grow. Um, and we found that these horses' teeth don't wear the same way. They're normal until they hit about six years old. And then after that, you should add between five and 10 years to whatever you think their teeth are telling you. Um, in captivity, these horses can live to be 40, if not older than that. Um, we had a horse pass away in 2020 that was at least 40 years old, if not 45 years old. So they're very, very hardy animals. Um, and then you've probably heard me just now in the first couple of minutes, I, I say horse and pony interchangeably, right? Um, genetically, these guys are horses. Um, they are shaped like horses, they behave like horses but they are pony sized. And that's really just a human thing that we've put on horses to kind of categorize them. Um, but but they, are, they are genetically horses. But people have called them banker ponies for hundreds of years, right? So there's nothing wrong with calling them banker ponies, banker horses, bankers. Um, you know, we, we call them both interchangeably. Um, colors. So we don't have a very wide range of color in the herd. You will not ever see a gray banker pony. If you see a gray banker pony, it's not a banker pony. Um, we have three main colors. We have chestnut, which is the kind of orange colored ones. Um, and then we have bay, which are brown with black legs. And then we have black. And those are pretty much your three colors that you're going to see here. We don't have pinto ponies like you have at Chanticleague. Um, foals will change colors multiple times before they shed out and grow into their, their adult coats. And so we get a lot of misidentified foals towards the end of the summer because they're starting to blow that first coat out and they look completely different than they, than they did when they were born. And the same goes for the adult horses from season to season. So as we're keeping records of these horses, we make sure that we have pictures of them at multiple times of the year because a horse is going to look very different with a big fuzzy winter coat than it is this time of year when they've shed out and they're sleek. They, they tend to change colors. And then other distinguishing characteristics as far as the way they look are markings. Um, we love horses with markings because it helps them identify, it helps us identify them. Um, a lot of times I'll get a call that, you know, there's, there's a black horse on the beach that's limping. I, I need, you know, a little bit more information than that. You know, we, we need like which side of the, the neck does the mane lay on? Does it have any scars? Do you see any kind of white on it? Um, a lot of them don't have any markings, so it can make, it, make them very tricky to identify. But um, you'll see white on their face, so you see stars, you see blazes like this mare has, um, socks. We have one stallion in the herd that has a blaze and four white socks, which is just great. I love him. He's great. Because anytime somebody calls me about a chestnut horse that's limping or something, I say, they have four legs? And they say, yeah, I don't know who he is. Um, so, so, you know, we... we um, and that's how we identify them. We don't mark them at all. They're not branded or anything. We, they're not microchipped or anything like that. So we identify them all based on the way they look, their associations, you know, like I said, scars, the way their mane lays, and things like that. And then we also have some interesting coat patterns in this herd. Um, we're currently working with UC Davis. They're trying to isolate um, some genes that cause particular coat patterns that we see a lot in this herd that are pretty rare, which is kind of neat. So that really has no bearing on the horse's you know, health and safety and all that kind of stuff. But it, it's, it's pretty neat to be able to, to add to that sort of scientific research with these guys. So. Um, and then just a little bit of like Corolla Horses 101. What, how do they live out there? You know, what is, what is their life like? Um, one of the main questions we get asked all the time is do they drink salt water? 
No. Um, they do not drink salt water, and they don't have big bellies because they're full of sodium. Um, they have big bellies because that's the way they're built. Um, but I'm sure most of you probably know that the Kurtuk Sound is primarily fresh water. And there's a lot of fresh water behind the dunes as well. You know, we've got the marsh, we have standing water that, that kind of comes and goes with the season and everything. Um, the horses on Shackleford, you'll often see dig for water. Our horses here in Kerala don't have to do that. They, they have water accessible to them. We have man-made canals here and things like that. Um, what do they eat? Uh, pretty much whatever is growing for the season. Um, you know, this time of year, they're, they're eating grass. The grass is coming in. Um, probably in about a month or so, the, the dunes will green up and we'll have sea oats start to come in and you'll see the horses on the dunes eating the sea oats. Um, they eat the tops of the grass. Um, that's one of the nice things about horses versus a lot of other livestock is they do not pull grass out by the roots. And so as a horse grazes, they're not necessarily, they're not really damaging the grass. The grass can grow back. Um, Seasonally, you'll see them eat acorns, which is not normal. Acorns are actually really toxic for most horses. Um, we had some researchers from NC State here probably about 10, 15 years ago um, that, that were doing analysis of what was in the horse's stomachs, and they found like insanely high levels of acorns in these horses' digestive tracts, which is not normal. But they've learned that that's a really good source of protein in the fall, and so you'll hear them you know, in the fall crunching on the acorns um, as they're falling off the live oaks up there. And then persimmons, um, you know, we have uh, native persimmon trees here. And so in the fall, one of the coolest things to see is, is when the horses start shaking the trees to get the persimmons to, to fall off and they'll, they'll eat those, which again, are not really that great for most domestic horses. The seeds aren't really good for them, but these guys love them, so. Um, horses live in family groups, we call them harems. And so most often you'll see one group with, with a stallion and then however many mares he is aggressive and dominant enough, dominant enough to, to keep. Um, some stallions don't have that drive, and so you'll see individual stallions that, that are bachelors that just don't have mares. Um, there's nothing wrong with them. They're not lonely. Um, that's just how they live. You know, there's some stallions that, uh, it, it's all the time, people call and yell at me. Like, He's lonely. Do something about it. He's not lonely. <laughs> um, a lot of times the bachelor stallions will, like, join up with each other, and so, especially this time of year. So we've got these bands of bachelor stallions causing trouble because it's spring and, and they're feeling frisky. So, um, But normally what you see is, is the family group where you have a stallion and then mares. Sometimes you'll have a lieutenant stallion that's kind of beneath the main stallion on the pecking order, um, but the mare's always in charge. So the girls are, are, unless the stallion perceives some kind of threat, the mares are gonna be the one that are running the show. They're gonna be the ones that are leading everybody, you know, to water, to eat, when they're ready to go, whatever. Um, the stallion, if you see horses walking down the beach, the stallion's always gonna be at the back, and the mare's gonna be at the one at the front. So. so that's a little bit about the horses themselves. Um, what about management, you know, why, what do we do to manage them? Why do we need to manage them? What goes into management? Um, the Crawl Wild Horse Fund is a 501c3 nonprofit. So we are the, the um, nonprofit that is tasked with, with managing the herd and caring for the herd. But we don't do it in a vacuum. Um, we operate under a, a advisory board that, that is organized by the county, by Currituck County. Um, and that advisory board consists of the Wild Horse Fund, Currituck County, the state of North Carolina, and then also U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And we have a management plan that outlines everything that we do. Um, so, you know, we're not just out here making decisions based on what seems like the right thing to do that day. We are following this management plan um, that, that a lot of work went into. Um, it was about 15 years in the making. As you can imagine, all of those different entities all have very, very different opinions on, you know, how the horses should be managed and, and how the environment should be managed. So, um, but, but now it's, it's, a, it's a very, very well-run advisory board with everyone working very cooperatively, which is wonderful. Um, and so again, you know, we are the caretakers of the herd. We can make the decisions we need to make. We don't have to go to that advisory board to, to ask them if we're going to remove a horse or anything like that. But it all does get rep reported quarterly. Um, and it, we, we have public meetings. I had one this afternoon, once a quarter, where we meet and report and all that goes on county records. So, and I say this just to, you know, if, if you're interested in what is the day-to-day -day like with, with, you know, the management of these horses, you can go on the Currituck County website, pull up the advisory board meeting minutes and agenda and my report and read every single thing that's happened in that quarter. Um, all right, and then, let's see. 
Um, one of the, the big things that we do to manage is the, to manage the population. Um, <clears throat> we have a, a population agreement that is signed by all of these entities, which again, was a long time coming. It took a lot of work to get there. It was not signed. This, this board was, was um, put into place in the early 2000s. Our population agreement for these horses was not signed by all of the entities until 2018. Um, prior to 2018, every single one of us had a separate page in the management plan stating what we felt like the population should be. Um, we came to the table a couple years ago and said, look, we need to get a handle on it. You know, we know that, that number one, we need to have a viable population of these horses on the beach if they're going to survive there. They have to be genetically viable. Um, we also recognize that that might not line up with what's environmentally sustainable. Right? And so, you know, the last thing we need are horses that are starving to death or horses that are damaging the environment really badly. And we recognize that. And we recognize that our number that the, that the geneticist from Texas A&M said that we need was 130 horses for genetic health of this herd, minimum um, 110. But we recognize that if we start to see major environmental degradation or issues within the herd, we might have to adjust that number and, and go with plan B. Um, we, we told Fish and Wild, Wildlife that we were gonna start counting the herd, doing herd counts more often, um, figure out exactly how many horses. Prior to that, it was you know, around 80, around 90, around 100, because they're hard to count. You know? they, they're on 8,000 acres. A lot of it is completely inaccessible to people. Um, and even flying over in a helicopter, you don't see all of them. They're under trees, they're under houses and things like that. So we, we really started a, a pretty hefty um, project to, to bring more staff on board, to have people out on the beach seven days a week monitoring these horses, watching these horses, logging who they see, when they see them, where they are, um, so, that, so that we you know, knew what we were working with. And so once we started doing that, U.S. Fish and Wildlife came back to the table and said, okay, we'll accept your, your, your population of no less than 110 and no more than 130, which was a huge, huge win for the horses. Um, one of the ways that we manage the population is through contraception. So that's, that mare has a dart hanging out of her hip. Um, we use a non-hormonal contraception on the mares if they need it um, <clears throat> to to control the population. Right now, our herd size is 99. We don't need to main, we don't need to control the population right now. We need babies, and so we don't have mares that are being contracepted. But if we need to, we can. Um, it's a non-hormonal birth control. It does not affect the way they behave. Um, it just makes it it basically. Uh, creates a shell around their egg that said so that it cannot be fertilized. So they still cycle, they still behave normally, um, but they just can't get pregnant. And it's fully reversible. So, um, you know, if we had a mare that, that had a baby this summer and for whatever reason our vet said, you know, this mare needs a, a year off from, from having foals, then I could go out there, dart her, give her a year or two off. Um, you have to redart them once a year um, in order for it to, to work. And then in two or three years, stop darting her and hope that she gets pregnant again. Um, and then another, that also, it controls the population. It also helps us manage the genetics a little bit. So say we have a mare that started to consistently produce foals that had leg issues. You know, they were born with crooked legs or something like that. Then we could say, all right, we're going to make sure that this mare stays contracepted. That way we don't have to remove her because, you know, obviously we don't want her producing foals that are then going to pass on genetic problems to, the, to its offspring. So we can contracept her, leave her wild. She can still do her wild horse thing not come live at the farm with us, um, but just not produce any foals. Um, we, we've done that with um, several different family lines of these horses. We identified a, a family line of horses that all had eye issues. And so, you know, we weren't sure if it was genetic or not. So we sent DNA of, of six of these horses that all had eye problems and they were all related to UC Davis. They ran ocular panels on them and they came back and said, there's nothing there. It was all just a coincidence, which is a pretty impressive coincidence for six horses that are all related to have eye issues, but there was nothing there. But if there had been, we could have then talked with our vet, talked with the geneticist and said, is this something that we want to breed out of the herd or is it a problem we can live with? Right? I mean, a horse that loses one eye, it's fine. It can survive. Um, but, you know, if our vet said, nope, that's not something you want passed down, then we can identify members of that family and contracept those mares so that they're not having babies that also have eye issues. So it's a really handy tool to have. 
So what is, what is all this tell us and what do we learn and how does all of this data that we're collecting help us? Um, you know, what have we learned as we, we collect? You know, like I said, we have staff out in, out in the field seven days a week. They, they have a Google form that they fill out when they see a horse. They write down latitude and longitude coordinates. They um, write down any behaviors that they, that they notice. They write down if they notice, the, you know, the horse approaching a vehicle or approaching a person. All that kind of stuff gets recorded. They take pictures and upload the pictures. And so we've learned some pretty cool things from, from this data that we can now track. We can throw it in a spreadsheet and get graphs and, and all this really neat stuff. Um, we've learned a lot about habitat use. You know, we, we, can, we can go and, and pick one horse that is easily ad identified. You know, a lot of our, you might not, there's some horses, like I said, that, that are really easy to identify and it's a pretty safe bet that if one of our staff writes down they saw top notch, it was definitely top notch because he is very distinct looking. And so we can go through that data you know, run a query on top notch and then track his latitude and longitude coordinates on a map. And so that can show us where top notch has been. It's not completely accurate because that's only where we can see him. I mean, you know, he probably went places in the marsh that we can't track him, but it gives you a really good idea, at least of, you know, north to south movement. You know, how far does this horse move in a day or in a week or whatever? Um, and then it also, it tells us how the horses are using their habitat, right? So at different times of year. So a big part of, of what the fund does is habitat preservation. You know, the horses have to have somewhere to live. Um, and so this data can help us identify the areas where the horses use, the, the areas the horses use the most at certain times of year. And so if we are looking at possibly purchasing property to put into conservation for the horses, it's a lot easier to find property that the horses are already accessing than to buy property that the horses never go to and hope they go there. And it's the one thing I've learned doing this job is that you can't make them do anything. <laughs> like, they're not going to do it. If you want them to go that way, they're going to go that way. So, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to kind of meet them in the middle than it is to try and move them somewhere else. And so that data can really help us identify the areas that the horses use the most. Um, illness and injuries and things like that. Um, if we have a horse that passes away that we suspect was something like polluted water um, or some sort of you know, toxic substance that the horse got into. We can go back in those daily logs and we can see where that horse was and who that horse was with, um, which is really important. You know, we, that's happened where we've had horses that, that have died from contaminated water. And I can go back, look at the daily logs and see what other horses were with that horse the previous week to make sure that we keep an eye on them and make sure that they're not gonna have issues too. Um, and then again, it also tells us where that horse was. So then we can go out, we can take water samples, see if we can identify anything that might be there. Um, and combining this data with the DNA, it really, really gives us a good idea of how these horses behave and interact with each other. Um, you know, we know horses are territorial. We also know that they move around a lot, but until we kind of merge this information together, we didn't really realize how far these horses move across their territory. Um, you know, we'll, we'll have a stallion that we've only ever seen up by False Cape State Park uh, at the state line, all the way up in Virginia, and then identify a daughter of his down by the cattle garden Kerala. That's 11 miles, you know, and 8,000 acres. And so, you know, that tells us that somebody was, was doing some traveling, you know, whether it was the stallion, it was the mare, um, you know, which is good. That, that's, that diversifies the genetics. It shows us that these horses are moving out of the range that they're born into, which is good, healthy, natural behavior. Um, so it, it can be very eye-opening as, as far as their behavior goes. Um, and then again, the herd count is very, very important. We have an accurate herd count. We have every single horse is accounted for in our records. I shouldn't say every single horse. There are probably a handful of horses that live in the marsh that we never see out there that we never will see. So you can probably add five or six maybe to that herd count. It's, it's entirely possible, but not, not likely. Um, but, but we have an accurate herd count. So we know who we have, we know where they are. Um, and, and so that helps us with this habitat management and also helps our relationship with fish and wildlife and with the state environmental people as well. Um, 
you know, basically what it boils down to is the more we know about these horses, the better equipped we're going to be to save them. Um, it's very, very important that we maintain a wild population of these horses. They are banker horses because they are wild. You know, these, these adaptations that they've developed, they develop because they are wild horses. And so if we don't have a wild population eventually, you know, it could be a couple generations from now, but eventually they won't be the same. Um, so it is really, really important that we keep their habitat safe and that we keep them there in their habitat. Um, and just some current statistics for the herd. Um, like I said, we have 99 in the herd right now, and that includes the three new foals that have been born this year. Um, since 2022, so since last year, we, we had eight foals born last year. We had six that survived, plus the three this year. Um, we're off to a slow start this year. People have been asking me that. Yeah, it's kind of low. Um, you know, I couldn't tell you why. It could be environmental. It, yeah, who knows? But, um, you know, we, we've got three last year this time. I want to say we probably had five or six by this time last year. Um, Removals in the last year, we've, we've removed five horses from the herd for various reasons, whether it was um, habituation issues with um, becoming aggressive towards people, things like that, or illness or injury. Um, four of those have survived. We darted three mares with PZP last year under the advice of our, our uh, veterinary, and the PZP is the, the contraception. Um, since 2016, when we started keeping these records, these more detailed records, we've had 41 foals born. That's kind of like, you know, when we only have eight, nine, 10 a year, you kind of feel like you have a low number of foals being born, but we've had 41 since 2016. So that's, that's not a bad number. Um, we've got 36% of, of the mares and the females in the herd are producing foals. Um, once we have the, the mares, the young mares that are not old enough to produce foals in the next couple years, we'll be up to 50% of the females in the herd producing offspring, which is not a bad number. We'd like to get higher, but that's not a bad number. Um, we have 23 horses that are being financially supported at our farm over on the mainland in Grandy, and we'll get to that a little bit later. And since 2016, we've adopted out 12 horses that have had to be removed from the herd. So kind of just an overview of the numbers, the stats, the statistics that we keep track of. Oh, sorry, this was my slide for the stats and statistics, babies. All right, so Ill illnesses, injuries, intervention. You know, when do we get involved? We try to stay hands off as much as possible. You know, again, the more we intervene, the more we're gonna change the natural makeup of this herd, the more we're gonna change the way these horses are at the very root of their being. However, um, we are also managing an endangered breed um, so breed conservation is very, very important. If we can save a horse that is very genetically valuable, even if it means that horse will no longer be wild, that's very important. Um, we also are not ever gonna leave a horse to suffer in the wild. So if a horse has, has um, suffered a catastrophic injury, then, then that is a situation where we will definitely intervene, whether to euthanize that horse in the field or if our vet feels that we can, we can potentially treat that horse, then we will remove it for treatment if, if our vet recommends that we do that. Um, removal, you know, again, is not something that we take lightly. It, it's having to remove a horse from the wild herd is heartbreaking. We hate doing it, even if we know we're saving their life. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not something that we're going to do at the drop, of the drop of a hat. And it's not something we're going to do for, for, you know, we get, where these horses get injuries all the time where I'll get calls and people say, that looks like it hurts. Yeah, it really does look like it hurts, you know. But he's going to be okay. You know, he will survive. We've seen these horses survive some really, really, really gnarly um, um, injuries that, that a domestic horse probably wouldn't survive. But that's what makes them strong. That's what, you know, th that for that horse to survive that injury and then go on and produce offspring, you know, when you say survival of the fittest, that really is what we have going on here. And it's important to maintain that as best as possible. And, you know, balance management with letting them be wild. Um, once a horse is removed from the wild, it cannot go back to the wild. Um, these horses are not vaccinated. They do not receive any kind of routine veterinary care. So for us to take a horse off, take it into a farm or a hospital setting, it could very easily pick up a communicable disease that a domestic horse is vaccinated for, no big deal. You put that horse back out in the wild and suddenly all 99 horses in the herd have flu or strangles or something very catastrophic like that that would wipe out the herd. Um, they also 
also domesticate very quickly. Um, and that is part of their nature. It's part of their breed. You know, these horses were, for as wild as they are, they were also used by people for generations, right? Um, and so it is in their nature to just be good around people and to be easy to handle for the most part. Um, they domesticate really quickly. So if we're taking a horse off the beach that has um, an injury that requires really intensive care, which all of them would, um, within a day, that horse is domesticated. It's eaten out of the palm of your hand. It's used to having fresh water. You can put a halter on it and catch it. Um, and so taking a horse like that and putting it back out in the wild would be dangerous and also pretty cruel. Um, you know, for as much as we want these horses to be wild, once they're at the farm and they have fresh water, they have hay and grain, you know, they're being taken care of to, to do that for the, the, the length of time that it would take to get that horse better and then just go, all right, bye, you know, you're back out there in the wild, um, would not really be the best thing for that horse. So, um, and then you would also have horses approaching people and, you know, trying to go into houses and things like that. So, um, but, you know, our, our, our general rule of thumb is that I, we get asked all the time, like, you know, do, would you treat horses in the field? Our general rule of thumb is that if a horse is suffering from something, that we can catch it and fix out in the wild, it doesn't need to be catch, caught and fixed. Um, it, it will be okay. We are generally only pulling horses off the beach that need really, really intensive care. And 90% of the time, that's not even care we can provide at home at our farm. That's care that has to take place at, at NC State, at their hospital there, so. Um, and I have some case studies. He was pulled off for hoof issues, and he's alive and well and lives in Gates County now. His name's Tradewind. Um, so just some examples of when we intervene and why we intervene. Um, I've got a couple of the top reasons why we will, will intervene. Um, so this captain was an older horse. Um, once we got him to the farm and were able to age him and also based on some of his offspring that are in their 20s, we think that he was well into his 30s when we pulled him off the beach. So at the beginning of the summer, he came out of the marsh looking really rough. He was very skinny, um, but he was okay. He was getting around, you know, he was grazing, he was drinking. He was moving around like normal. Every time I'd go check on him, he'd kind of give me the stink eye and didn't want to be messed with. So, you know, we, we want to let an old stallion die in the wild. They deserve that. And so we kept a really close eye on him all, all summer long. Um, he didn't drop any more weight, but he didn't gain any weight. And then towards the end of the summer, we noticed that he had what looked like an abscess, as you can see un underneath his eye there. And so I reached out to our vet and said, hey, you know, Captain, who was aware of him already, you know, he'd been updated on him through throughout the summer. Um, and I said, Captain, looks like he, he has an abscessed tooth. Um, and, and, you know, so I think either we need to pull him or euthanize him out, out in the wild. And so, you know, our vet said, bring him, bring him in, you know, let's see, we, we might be able to pull the tooth and give him some antibiotics and he might have a couple years of, of retirement at the farm. So we did. Um, we caught him, got him to the farm, got his, his teeth all fixed up. He had a giant hole in the top of his mouth that went up into his sinus cavity. And so as he was eating, Everything that he ate got packed up into the like top of his face. It was gross. Um, but we got him all cleaned out, got him comfortable, got him on some antibiotics and everything. Um, and he lived with us at the farm for about two months. Um, but unfortunately, we couldn't fix the hole in his head. Um, you know, that would have required really extensive surgeries and probably not would have would not have been successful anyway. Um, and so, you know, our, our vet said, "Look, you're gonna ha we're gonna have to be out here flushing all of this gunk out of his head." once a week. That's not humane. Um, and so we, we ultimately made the decision to euthanize Captain so that we didn't have to put him through that and, and it was never going to get better. But, you know, at the end of his life, he, he was very comfortable. He was very well fed. He lived in a stall through Hurricane Dorian. Um, you know, so he, he had a pretty good life for a wild horse. He lived most of it wild. He has lots of offspring that we've identified through DNA. Um, and so, so that's, that's just a really good example of sort of an end of life scenario that, that we would have with one of these older, older horses. Um, another situation is when we have a horse that has an infection or some kind of, um, you know, disease that it has picked up. So we, um, in 2020, we had a horse that presented with a fungal infection called pythiosis. Um, pythiosis is a really, really nasty fungal infection that you 
primarily only used to see um, in more tropical climates. Um, but because of climate change and bad water and all that, that bad stuff, um, we're starting to see cases of it up here. And so our vet identified what it was. It's a very distinctive um, lesion that they get from, from, the, from the infection. Um, identified it and, and said, you know, we, we have to get him off immediately. Um, there is a vaccine that, that, that helps um, get rid of the fungal infection along with surgery, but it has to be given to the horse within 14 days of infection. So time was of the essence. So we scrambled, we caught him, we got him on the trailer. He went straight to NC State. He was there for about six weeks. He went through five or six different surgeries. Um, not a lot is known about this infection. Um, you know, it's very rare. We call it, they call it a fungal infection. It, it actually kind of falls somewhere in between fungus and bacteria. So it doesn't even fit in any, like it's, it's nasty stuff. Um, and most horse owners are not gonna have the resources to get a horse through being treated for this. Um, we are very lucky that we did. And so not only did that mean that Riptide was able to survive, um, it also meant that the vets, in NC, the vets at NC State learned a lot about treating this infection. They learned a lot. Um, and since Riptide, we've had three others that have had it and they've learned a lot from them as well. Um, and now, Riptide turned four in May, and we are now talking with the, the vets at NC State and along with our local vet here of actually breeding him with one of the other mares that survived pithiosis. And they would like to look into studying the possibility of that, of the, the two horses that survived and their foal possibly having antibodies to this infection. And if that's the case, they could develop a vaccine that actually prevents this, which would be huge because it is fatal. It is 80 something percent fatal if not, if not treated. Um, you know, so, so again, not only did we save him, but we really helped a lot of vets and researchers learn a lot about a disease that, that previously not a lot was known about. And then this is Finn. Um, Finn died in February. Um, Finn was an 11-year-old stallion, which is prime of life for a stallion. You know, that, that is like right in the prime of life for one of these stallions. He was a bachelor. Um, and he was seen the day before we got the call about him fighting with other horses. And that night, he didn't move. Um, someone called us and said, hey, this horse has been standing in my yard since yesterday. I think something's wrong with him. And we got up there, and his leg was very obviously broken. Um, and it was broken in a way that could not be fixed. And so we, you know, obviously confer with our vet who said, yes, I can't fix that. He needs to be euthanized. And so our vet humanely euthanized him. And so that's another example of when we will intervene with a catastrophic injury like that. Um, but it was natural causes, you know. So for as heartbreaking, heartbreaking as it is to lose a horse, to lose any horse, with Finn, he died doing what he was supposed to do, you know. I mean, that, that's, that's how life is supposed to be for one of these horses, and it's not always pretty, um, but, but that's, that's life for them. So, and, and luckily we were there to end his suffering. I mean, he, he would have probably lived for a couple more days and it would have been pretty, pretty gruesome for him. So, you know, at least we were able to, to let him go before it got that bad. Um, and then there's when you have to remove a horse due to habituation, which is the most heartbreaking thing. It is more heartbreaking than losing a foal. It is more heartbreaking than, than anything to have to take a horse off the beach because of people. Um, this is Valentine. This is Valentine in 2018 um, when she started doing this. And we started a big campaign to try and get people to stop letting the horses approach their car. They learned that if they stood in front of the car, the car would stop, they could come around. People thought it was really cute, they'd roll down their windows and then the horses would start going through their bags and stuff. Um, that was in 2018. We stopped it for the winter. Um, we all drove around with scary things in our trucks, like coffee cans with rocks in them. And every time we saw them, we would shake them and scream and yell and scare them away from the vehicles. And it worked. Um, but then COVID hit and we had a lot of people on the 4 by 4 and a lot of people generate a lot of garbage. And this group of horses realized that there were tasty things in the garbage and they started getting into the garbage. And so we spent an entire summer, um, you know, we, we sent letters to homeowners, to property management. We were calling real estate companies multiple times a day saying, hey, this house has garbage that needs to be collected, you know, the horses are in it. Um, we tried aversive tactics again. Unfortunately, there's so many people, you can only do so much to scare a horse away um, before someone's going to get hurt. And so the November of 20... 
21 um, over Thanksgiving weekend. Um, it escalated to the point where someone threatened to put antifreeze in their garbage because they were tired of these horses getting into their trash. Um, the horses had also gotten very aggressive. Um, the stallion, who's not in this picture, but he was with her, would turn around and run backwards at you, kicking like he almost killed me a couple times. It, it, it got very dangerous. Um, and so we made the decision to take her and the stallion off. She was the lead mare, and um, he, he was, you know, the two of them were kind of the ringleaders. And so we, we pulled him off in December. And, you know, like I said, it was heartbreaking. It's awful to have to do that. Um, they're at our farm now. They're happy. They're healthy. Valentine is great. She's being started under saddle. Arrow, the stallion, is old, and he is never going to be rehabbed. He is always going to be very dangerous and very food aggressive. And we're very lucky that we have the resources to be able to care for him. Um, you know, in a normal rescue situation, a horse like him would be euthanized because he's not safe, and he's taking up space for horses that could be adopted out. Um, but luckily, that's not going to happen to him because we can handle him. But we also have his mother, who was one of the food lion horses, who did the same thing. So, like, he kind of <laughs> he kind of comes by it honestly. So you can't really blame him. But um, so those are those are the kind of the top examples of when and why we intervene. Um, you know, and and why we do it. So what happens to them after they come off the beach? Um, the Wild Horse Fund owns a 31-acre property just across the bridge in Grandy. We're kind of right across from the Cotton Gin, but before you get to Weeping Radish, back there off the road. Um, and it is a place where the horses have sanctuary um, for as long as they need it. Um, we do have an adoption program, but you know, the, the horses can live there their whole lives if they need to. Um, it's also an education center. We, we do events out there. We have open houses all summer long. The first one starts uh, next Wednesday. So we do those every single Wednesday all summer long from 10 to 2. People can come to the farm and see the horses there. There's an overhead view of it. This is actually a couple years ago. We've done some construction work since then. So... Um, but again, you know, it's, it's a place for sanctuary. These horses didn't ask to come out of the wild. Um, and, and so, you know, we do our best to, to keep them happy and healthy, give them, you know, a good life um, as best we can. And, and we cater to their own needs. They all have different behavioral issues, health issues. They all have different personalities. And so we, we try really hard to keep them all happy, you know, regardless of, of you know, the way they are. <laughs> um, a lot of them do have, you know, right now we've got 23 horses on the farm. I'd say out of those 23 horses, maybe two of them would be suitable for adoption. You know, the rest of them are old or have illnesses or, you know, injuries that, that require a lot of care um, or have behavioral issues. And again, it is a place for outreach and advocacy and education. Um, we take horses out. Um, again, most of the horses on the farm are not suitable to go out into public, but we do have some that are. Um, we have ambassador horses, and so you know, we've, we've been to nursing homes, we go to events, we go to schools, and then we also host school groups at the farm as well. So. How can people get involved? Um, you know, memberships, horse sponsorships, um, you know, sharing Facebook posts, things like that, advocate for these horses. We always tell people, these horses don't belong to us. The wild horses don't belong to us. Um, they belong to everybody, and so it's up to all of us to advocate for them. Um, we do have a community toolkit on our website that people can go to. Most of everything on there is free. There's videos and flyers. Um, we offer signs for people, especially if you have rental homes. Um, there's all kinds of information that you can access through our website to help educate people. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we just ask people to get involved and talk about the horses. You know, that's why we, I always appreciate doing this kind of thing to help educate people and hope that then you guys will go out and, you know, share what, what you've learned here and, and kind of impress upon people how important it is to save these horses and keep them safe. So... That is the end of my formal presentation. If you guys have questions, I'm sure you do. I'm happy to do my best to answer them. First of all, I'd like to thank you, Meg. You've done a yeah. wonderful job. Thank you, thank you. And I'm very grateful to you and your team because you have such an important job and you do Thank it so you. well. Two questions. Mm -hmm. Almedio, am I pronouncing his name correctly? I think he's passed on. Amadeo. Right. Mm -hmm. The stallion. Yes. Right. 
what is the history behind him? And currently, you said you have 99. How many harems, mm -hmm. stallions, and what's the average size of those? That's stallions? a good question. Um, yeah, so Amadeo was one of our ambassador horses that was pretty well known. Um, he was completely blind. He lived wild for most of his life. He was rescued in 2013 when he got into a fight with another stallion um, and got pushed out into the ocean and got caught up in a rip current. And he actually got swept like a mile and a half up the beach. This was before my time, but from what I've been told, um, he was swept up the beach about a mile and a half and Kerala Ocean Rescue got out behind him with jet skis and toe straps and pulled him in. Um, he was completely blinded by that point, so I mean, he just in shock. He was a mess, so he had to be taken out of the wild. Um, but he died in 2020, and he was the one, when I mentioned a horse that was well into their 40s, that was him. Um, so yeah, he, he was a cool horse, and he was a great ambassador because, again, he was a harem stallion his whole life, um, and he was completely blind, and he was so good with children. We could take him anywhere. I took him to music festivals and things like that, and he was just, he was such a good ambassador for his breed. He was a cool horse. Um, as far as the statistics with the, the herd, um, it's hard to say how many harems there are because it changes. Um, you know, and especially this time of year, you know, it's all kind of shuffling around. So it's, it's kind of impossible to, to say. Um, as far as the breakdown between mares and stallions, it's about 50-50. We do have more stallions than mares, but not many. So. If you raise your hand, I'll come to you with a question with the mic. Uh, Meg, thank you uh, for the information. I have two questions for you. Um, you talked about you don't tag the horses, yet you monitor them extensively through you know, manual efforts. So I'd be interested in, is there a reason you don't tag them for more efficiency reasons? And the second question is, the Outer Banks has had hurricanes coming through all the time. How do these animals react to that and survive that? Those are good questions. Um, so the tagging, I'll be completely honest with you, it's for aesthetic reasons. You know, we've been asked not to freeze brand the horses because then they'd have giant numbers on their butts. Um, you know, so would it make my job a lot easier if I could look at a horse and go, that's 53, I know who that is, yes. <laughs> um, but, you know, they would have like really big numbers freeze branded on their hips, so. Um, and then as far as hurricanes, you know, the, these horses have, have survived hurricanes for 600 years. So they kind of have this like institution, institutional knowledge, this kind of hive mind of knowledge of where to go to keep themselves safe. Um, so they know the high spots, you know, nowadays, unfortunately, they will go under houses and things like that, which, you know, we would rather they didn't because it's not safe. Um, but, you know, the, the, the habitat up there is, is vast. Um, and there's a lot of high spots. There's a lot of maritime forests. So they have a lot of places to go um, to get out of the storm. And quite frankly, they don't care, you know. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't affect them like it affects us. You know, to them it's windy and it's raining and they'll be fine the next day. Um, so, so yeah, you know, but it's always, you know, it's a risk. You always worry about it. Um, the Cedar Island herd, he lost over half of his herd during Hurricane Dorian. Um, and this is a man who has had banker ponies his whole life. He's in his 70s now. Um, you know, he knows what he's doing and he has, um, it keeps the horses very natural. You know, they're, they pretty much free range on the island and everything. And they went out to an island in the sound that he said he's never seen underwater. And then all of a sudden the water came up so quick they drowned. Um, you know, so it, it could certainly happen. Um, but again, it's one of those things where it's nature and, and we can't control it. Um, you know, we would never round them up and take them somewhere in a hurricane. Um, we get questions about that when a big one's coming. Um, you know, that's, that's just their life. That's what they have to, to, to deal with here. You said that, oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, James. Um, you said that three foals have been born so far. How many more mares do you expect to foal? It, it's impossible to say. I have no idea. <laughs> um, so every single mare in the herd, except for the three that were darted last year, could potentially be pregnant right now. So, I mean, I doubt we'll have 45 babies, but you know, <laughs> you never know. Then I'd be over the population. That could potentially be a problem, but, <laughs> but hopefully some more. We average around eight, you know, between six and eight a year. You had mentioned the daily log. Who does the daily log and what, what's involved in that? 
Yeah, so we have staff that are on the beach every day. We So we've got a staff of um, six part-time people and then myself that are out there every day. And we have iPads, and so it's all on a Google form. And so they just, every time they, they drive up on a horse or a group of horses, they open the iPad up and just, it's it's like a form of questions. So there's there's a set of, the same set of questions get answered for every single horse sighting. And so they, they fill it out, they hit submit, and it goes straight into... Google, and so then I can access it that way and see it. And it's great, you know, because then um, the other day somebody asked me if I'd seen a horse lately, and I said, let me look, and I pulled up the pictures, and there he was, and could say, yeah, he was here on this day doing this. Any other questions? Raise your hand. I'll come to you with the mic. Um, as a, a resident here with family and friends coming to visit, we used to always go with the tours with Corolla Wildlife mm -hmm. Force, and they don't do that anymore. Any right. guidelines for us who want to take people up there sure. and, and are concerned about the yeah. intrusiveness. Absolutely, no, it's a great question. Um, I always tell people, take a tour. You know, we work really closely with the tour companies. I do training for all the tour companies at the beginning of every season. It's basically the same presentation I just did here we do for the tour companies. Um, during the, the high season, we communicate with each other. So I send out an email every week to all the tour drivers with just updates and things like that. You know, if there's any issues, things they need to know. So, you know, they are all um, very on board with our mission, very supportive. Um, and, and we are supportive of them. You know, they, they really are our, our eyes and ears out there in the summertime. You know, the, the tour guides are out there more than we are, honestly, you know, and they're driving around all the time. So they're seeing these horses all the time. Um, so yeah, I, I always recommend taking a tour. Um, you know, and, and there's a lot less of an impact on the environment that way. Um, you know, you think about if every single person on one of those tours drove their own vehicle up the beach, what it would do to the environment. So. I, that's that's my recommendation. And you can't go wrong with any of them. They're all good. Any other questions? Hearing none. Rob? Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. So uh, on behalf of the Ducktown Council and all of you, I'm going to present Meg with this, this uh, wonderful picture here and grateful appreciation of your presentation, the Bias Speaker Series, Meg Puckett, May 18th, 2023, Duck, North Carolina. Thank you. And here's also, <laughs> this is it, just for you. Also, for anybody that's interested, June 20th uh, will be North Carolina's Changing Coast. And uh, th it'll be the same thing here. Uh, Dr. Reed Corbett will be here. He's the executive director of the Coastal Studies Institute and dean at ECU Integrated Co Coastal Programs. So it should be interesting. <laughs>